Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. It's really good to see you. Um, you know, I wanted to get started in sort of a more relaxed way today. Uh, I know that many of you, all of you, are writing papers and finishing up papers, including for this class. And we're really excited to read those. I've already been talking with a number of you about your ideas, and there's a lot of really good stuff there. So we're very happy about the hard work that you're doing. And just as a reminder, you'll have until tonight at 11.59 to turn in the paper. And you just wanna to go to CAT courses and submit under the assignment link, which was created today. If you can, and hopefully you can, do submit a Word document just so that we can see the word count and maybe even um, be able to uh, leave comments, although it's very likely that any of those will come on the rubric that each student will receive. But in any case, uh, just do your best to have everything in and a Word doc, doc if you can. You know, because you're working so hard, um, I actually wanted to take a moment and talk to you a little bit about some of my own work. And I just had a paper um, accepted for publication at Studies in Comparative International Development. And the reason I wanted to talk to you for a moment is because it's actually, actually very relevant to what we talk about in the class. And basically this paper is about these political conflicts over efforts to reform defense industry firms in developing countries. In a lot of countries, the military owns big industrial firms and the civilian governments advance efforts to take and privatize or take control of those enterprises. And the reason they do that is because the military has a lot of power and they can use their structural power to subvert competition, to compete with and maybe even bankrupt civilian firms. They have a lot of advantages that produce an unlevel playing field. And so these conflicts, these political battles over ownership and control really matter a great deal to economic development as well as democratic development. And this paper is about those conflicts and what determines their outcomes. <clears throat> so what I do is I put this in the context of a debate in the literature. Since the 80s, these globalization theorists, basically the neoliberal theorists, have been arguing that countries will privatize and reform and sell off their defense industries, including the ones owned by the military. And another group of scholars, a rival group, argues that states will do the opposite and they'll stay the course. But we need a theory that can explain why states would go in one way or the other. You know, what determines what they ultimately actually do? And do they stay the course or did they sell off those firms? What determines whether they go one way or the other? This is the debate or the question that I put this paper in the context of. And then I develop an argument and I, I argue that, you know, to understand the different outcomes, why, why countries succeed or fail at the reform, you need to look at different configurations of power between the military and civilians. And basically where the military has the advantage legislatively and bureaucratically, you should expect reform to fail. And where civilians have the advantage legislatively and bureaucratically in terms of their coalition and the strength of their institutions, you should expect reform to succeed. And I support the argument and the theory that I develop by using the method of difference to compare and analyze the cases of Chile and then Alfonsine era Argentina and then Menem era Argentina, these two different time periods that are different because the earlier time period results in failed reform or partial reform 
and then the latter time period results in full reform. And so these case studies are very rich with detail and interview evidence. And I did all sorts of archival work to gather evidence and develop a, a, a data set, a qualitative data set that I could use to analyze these cases and support my theory. And at the end of the day, at the very end, um, this is what you could potentially be, be left with if you, you, you put in the work. And so this is the end product. It was accepted at Studies in Comparative International Development, and it should probably come out in the next year or so. Um, but this was a paper that was under review for a year and a half before I ultimately got the, the final decision. It was, it was accepted for revise and re resubmit about three or four months ago. And I promptly returned it within a month and the reviewers and the editors accepted the final product. And um, yeah, so this is the research that I do. I study political economy and the defense sector, these uh, group and political conflicts over reform and the shape of the economy. I'm really inspired a lot by the focus on institutions and power relations. So I do that same kind of work in my own academic uh, political economy research. So if you're a student who's interested in grad school, or even if you just like these topics and you like learning about this, it's just neat to see that, you know, what we teach you in class, we're actually doing ourselves and in and, and making, well, every effort that we can to move the discipline forward. In this case, I'm really excited because this should be the probably the biggest paper in this literature on defense industries since, you know, the globalization theorists in the 80s when they first predicted or anticipated that all countries would converge on on neoliberal reform and development. But that's where I'll leave it. And, um, you know, it's just an interesting topic. And well, if you have any questions or comments, I encourage you to make those. Otherwise, let me transition to the lecture and the discussion for today. So as you know, we're discussing democratization and in particular, the economic dimensions of democratization, the different interests and classes, interest groups and class struggles that seem to determine or shape democratic transitions or the, the endurance of authoritarian regimes. And so far I've introduced the concept of a democratic transition. And we've also talked about a couple different traditions or perspectives on democratization, both of which focus on those economic or those socioeconomic factors. The first one that I showed you is the social forces tradition. And you'll recall that this is that, that tradition that focuses on relative class power and really configurations of power. Much like the theoretical argument that I just talked about in my own paper that was accepted, the social forces tradition focuses on those different configurations of power relations. And in particular, the strength of the middle class and the strength of the landowners and capitalists. And what we expect from this perspective is for the strengthening of the middle class and the weakening of the large landowners and capitalists to lead to a democratic transition because the middle class and the working classes are large and moderate and they demand reforms that enfranchise them and allow them to participate meaningfully in decision making. And that involves a transition to democracy. The large landowners and the capitalists on the other hand, the elites, 
they benefit from authoritarianism and autocracy because it allows them to protect their wealth and their income and their privileges and, and really to strengthen their rule uh, despite the, the divergent interests of the masses who make up the larger proportion of society. And so when we think about the predictions, the tradition generates really the following two hypotheses. We can think of the tradition as boiling down to basically these two propositions where you have a strong landowner capitalist class and a weak middle class or working class, you should expect the endurance or the survival of the, of the authoritarian regime and really the return to autocracy. If we think about an attempted democratic transition as involving this moment where the country can transition to democracy or return to autocracy and for the moment, <clears throat> the fate or the future is sort of up in the air. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the other hand, where we have a strong middle and working class and a weak landowner capitalist class, you should expect a transition to democracy because at that moment, the weak, the working in middle classes will harness their strength to impose the transition to democracy and facilitate the transition to democracy. Now, what does that look like? Well, what it looks like is collective action and the mobilization of, of masses. And it looks like protest action in organized, collective, forceful articulation of the demand of, or the demand for a democratic transition. We saw that in, for example, South Korea. We saw different examples in Latin America as well, where there's a key role for the sort of expression of the masses in, in, in protest and collective action. Now, on the other hand, where the landowner capitalist class, the elites have the upper hand and the middle classes and the working classes are, are weak, you should expect the state and the elites in control of the state to turn to repression and to use the means at their disposal to perpetuate authoritarian rule. And when we talk about the strength of these classes, what we really mean as a reminder is the organization of those classes, the density of those classes, the extent to which they are concentrated and organized in larger networks or holes, labor movements, unions, confederations of employers and capitalists, associations representing the interests of different segments of the working or middle class or the capital class and so on. This is what we mean. We mean the organization and the density and the strength of the organization of the classes. But at the end of the day, the tradition does generate these simple, relatively crisp um, predictions about how different configurations of power, relative class power will affect the potential transition to democracy. And so what we need then for a transition to democracy is we need a strong middle class and a relatively weak landowner capitalist class. Now remember, remember that this is, this is relative, not absolute. So we're talking about the relative strength of the classes. So the middle class's strength relative to that of the landowners, the landowner's strength relative to that of the working in middle classes. But now that we have this tradition and we have these predictions, now that we can see the way that these different factors work together to produce or determine different outcomes, I wanna do some exercises and engage in some, some teaching and some, some, lesson, some lesson work that helps us to think through some of these different scenarios. And I want to involve you as much as possible as always. And so what I've done is I've created some scenarios, some hypotheticals where I give you pieces of information and I ask you to make a choice about what course of action to take and then why. And please don't race for the exits. I see that a few people have already left. Uh, 
class does involve a little bit of activity and some, some engagement. And so this is where we begin to experience this in a different way. And I want now to incorporate you. And so take a moment and step back and consider this situation or this scenario that I'm inserting you in, and then engage with it and respond via the chat so that I can respond to you and, and support you while you reason through it. But the first scenario is as follows. What we're doing is we're examining the relationship between relative class power and the political behavior of different actors. And in this case, I am telling you and in, in creating a scenario where you are a landowner. So you're a capitalist in this case, you're a member of the elite. And what we're looking at is elite strategy under a situation of strong elites and weak masses. So where landowners and capitalists have the advantage. And the scenario is as follows. You are a landowner in a developing country where landowners and capitalists have the upper hand over the middle classes. The country is a dictatorship and its economic policies favor the landowners. The middle classes have been demanding free elections for years and recently started organizing large protests in the square of the capital. Now the dilemma arises over the following. Some landowners want to press the regime to hold elections. Other landowners want to continue to support the regime. Your support for one strategy or the other will decide what happens. And the question for you is, should you press for free elections or support the regime and why? And so take a moment and think about this and then tell me in the chat what you would do and, and why, given this information. Thank you. 
Listen, everyone, we're doing a good job thinking about this, but I also want you to think most importantly about the variable of relative class power. There are a lot of good reasons that people are putting forward for why they would choose what they do, but I want you to think above all and almost exclusively about relative class power. So think about the pieces of information that I give you and think about that variable and think about what that variable suggests the best or the optimal course of action would be. And so this is really the task for us. So if I'm asking you, for instance, what is the political reason for your choice? That's what I mean. I want you to think about the balance of power and how that should inform your decision. Good, Matt, yeah. So those of you who've already engaged and I've responded to, what I'm, I'm especially interested in is, is you kind of kind of doubling back and thinking about the question or the, the variable of relative class power. So politically, strategically, in terms of the balance of power, what is the best course of action if you are a landowner and this is the setup, the balance of power, so to speak? strong elites and weak masses. Relative class power, this is the variable that we're focusing on here. And again, I'm also stressing to some of you, just focus on the information that I give you. Everything else is held constant, is everything else is kind of taken off the table. So some of you are saying, oh, well, there could be it could be uh, relationships with the global community or more growth under the alternative. That's, that's not, that's not the, the issue. Just focus on the, the politics, the balance of power, the, the information and the interest, what I've given you here. So don't imagine or create anything outside of the, the hypothetical that I've given you. Good, good, Karina. That's really good reasoning. Excellent. I'm just gonna, we we're getting a lot of engagement. So I want to cover as many people as possible. And, and, and so at a certain point, um, this hypothetical will run its course and in a moment we'll, we'll reconvene. But I want to continue to support as many of you as possible as we reason through this. Is, is, uh, Odd as some of these hypotheticals might seem, I, I assure you that this can be useful because these are the choices and the alternatives in the strategic contexts that actors find themselves in. And when we talk about the political economy of development, this is what we're talking about. The interests and the power relations and the, the context and how different circumstances might inform different behaviors.
Good, Victor. But there's also a, an important political reason, right? What about the, the balance of relative class power? Does it suggest anything about what course of action you should take? You know, what I wanna ask you all is, so many of you are identifying that, well, if I'm a landowner and my interests are already best served by the authoritarian regime, I don't have any incentive to change course and support democracy. That's true, but that's an economic consideration that's already sort of implicit. I want us to think about the politics. What about the balance of relative class power? Is there any reason is there any reason that you have to cede to the protesters and hold elections? Does the relative class power of the protesters compel you to do that? Look closely at the information that I give you. Think about the balance of power. Think about the politics of this situation. Quite apart from your interest and your incentive to preserve the system that already benefits you, what about your ability to actually do so? And then in turn, is there any reason that you would need to cede to the protesters? Matthew, Matt says, uh, excuse me, absolutely not, let them eat cake, which I love. <laughs> So we're at a point now where I think it might be useful for us to pivot and for me to talk a little bit about this example and what course of action should be taken based on the balance of relative class power. And so before I continue, let me just let me just double back and, and, and reiterate. So this is a circumstance where you're a landowner and landowners and capitalists have the upper hand, are stronger than the masses. And as a landowner, you benefit from the status quo, which is a dictatorship whose economic policies favor the landowners and the capitalists. The question is, how do you respond to large protests by the masses demanding free elections? Do you have any reason politically or is there any reason related to the balance of power or the ability of the protesters that you should see to their demands? Is there any reason related to the politics of the situation as I've, pre as I've presented it, quite apart from your, your self-interest? And as many of you have pointed out, there isn't any political reason and specifically, you don't have to cave in. The landowners are stronger than the middle classes. The organization and the density and the concentration of landowners and capitalists makes this class stronger than the working and middle classes. And there's the added point that if you press for elections unnecessarily, the transition will ultimately reduce your wealth because the masses already disproportionately bear the cost of the economic policies of the dictatorship. 
And so democracy would almost inevitably result in more moderate and egalitarian policies that would, re that would re redistribute income and wealth and that would disproportionately harm you in the same way that the masses are disproportionately harmed by the status quo under the dictatorship. And so perpetuating the dictatorship reinforces the regime's favorable economic policies. And there's the added fact that you're simply in a stronger position collectively than your rival, the working and middle classes. There's a final point that helps to clarify the choice and the course of action most optimal given your interests and your political capacity. You should support the regime until the cost of repression exceeds that of a transition to democracy. So in other words, you should use the power of the state to repress and to dilute and demobilize the pro-democratic opposition to the dictatorship until and unless doing so becomes more costly than a transition to democracy itself. Now, why would it become more costly? Maybe because of international sanctions imposed by other powers who want to punish the abusive behavior of the state. You know, maybe because the masses themselves strengthen in their organization and it becomes likely or possible that they could engage in reprisal and, and suppress or repress you, um, possibly because a civil war becomes likely or possible, um, possibly because strikes and protests and collective action stop production and put a bottleneck on your sources of income and in the sources of, of all the gains that this entire situation revolves around. You can imagine then that there might be a number of reasons why the cost of repression can exceed the cost of democratization. But the point that I wanna to make to you is that under this circumstance, you don't have any political reason in terms of the balance of relative class power to cede to the protesters. You are in a stronger position than they are and your interests are already better served by the status quo. And so you should stay the course and you should use the power of the state up and until doing so becomes more costly than, than democratization itself. So this is, is how you should be responding from the perspective of relative class power. Some of you may object and you may say that this doesn't sit, sit well with me, but from the perspective of you know, this simple theory, this simple model, these are the choices and the alternatives available to the different actors under different circumstances. Let's look at a new scenario and I want to engage you in the same way. And again, I want you to be thinking from the perspective and the vantage point of the variable of relative class power, that balance of power between elites and masses, between capitals and land capitalists and landowners and working and middle classes. And so in this new scenario, we're looking at the strategy of the masses, of the working and middle classes under the following circumstances, weak elites and strong masses. Okay, so the tables are now turned. We've got the flip side, the reverse. So here's the scenario. You are a worker in a developing country where the middle classes have the upper hand over landowners and capitalists. The country is a dictatorship whose economic policies favor the old elites. The middle classes have been demanding free elections for years and recently started organizing large protests. The authorities imposed a state of emergency, jailing protesters. Here's the dilemma. Some pro-democratic leaders want to defy the order and plan larger protests. Other leaders want to obey the order and instead ask for calm. Your support for one strategy or the other 
will decide what happens because you are a union and movement leader in this circumstance. So my question for you, given this information, given this scenario, is should you organize larger protests or should you obey the order and why? And so take a moment and step back and think about this, this scenario and this information that I give you in this strategic context. And I want you to think carefully and critically about this, engage with it, and then respond to it in the chat and I'll engage with you and support you as you reason out of the situation. I love this so much. Trying to try not to get too excited, but I just told you about how I wrote a paper about configurations of power and reform. And so these sorts of questions really excite me. And those of you who have already begun to engage uh, can see that. But continue, continue thinking through this, those of you who are still working on it. This is excellent. A lot of really thoughtful responses. Kind of learn a little bit from everyone because everyone highlights sort of like a different aspect of the situation. And what's neat is it's a hypothetical, right? So it's something that we just created or just made up, but it is a situation that is entirely plausible and that does correspond to the ideal typical situation or scenario under different circumstances of, or different configurations of power. And so, you know, we can think about examples in real time that do correspond to these situations, more or less. And, well, for now, we'll keep it theoretical because we can learn a lot from the different examples. But as you can see, uh, when you think about relative class power and you think about the power or the capacity of your class to shape an outcome, it becomes a different conversation. And in some ways, choices become much more clear cut. This is an important variable in politics. Power relations matter a great deal. All I can say to you is don't be, don't be afraid of them. There are some old timers in political science who say that power is too fleeting and too amorphous and difficult for us to understand or really study. But what are we doing here in politics if not studying power, configurations and formations of power? And so don't shy away from this variable and you know, think about power analytically, but also politically, because I would suggest to you that the implications politically are, are hugely important. And so I'm gonna continue supporting you as you think about this stuff. And um, I'm happy to see that 
there's a lot of consistency in your responses. Really good responses, everybody. Really, really good. And what this highlights too is, you know, you, you have to understand your power, right? You've got to recognize your strength. And that is the first face of power, right? Recognizing your capacity. And in politics, awareness is often critical because things only happen in a time frame that is relevant to a politician or to a political movement. But that movement must understand its position first so that it can act in that moment. And so many moments are missed or lost because the window of opportunity closes before actors recognize their strength. And this is often why transitions, for example, can succeed or fail because of the organized and collective action and the awareness in the, the flexibility and the, the sort of ability to articulate of the, of the movement for democracy. And so in countries like South Korea, Ar Argentina, Chile, these are all places where mass has played an important role. Even in the cases where it's argued that it was mainly an elite negotiation that produced the transition, the elites themselves were often you know, forced into discussing the possibility by virtue of of the, the protests and the collective action of, of unions and teachers and taxi drivers and ordinary people. Victor asks, how would you be able to tell if one class has more power than the other? Would it be the action that the authorities are imposing the state of emergency? This is a good question. And, and obviously in practice, it's often difficult or hard to tell, right? But in practice, we often are able to understand the differences by looking at the organization or the density or the, the strength of the organization of the different classes. And so, for example, is the labor or union or working class movement better organized than the employer's movement or capitalist association? In some countries, that is the case. Workers are much better organized. In some countries, capitalists are much more densely organized in, in associations representing their interests. So you can look at the density of the organizations and their strength in terms of their numbers and their resources, in terms of their uh, infrastructure. You can look at a lot of different metrics, so to speak. And in the research on these issues, that's often what they do. They look at those types of indicators that I just mentioned. But obviously, in these examples, these scenarios, we're thinking much more hypothetically. So we think in terms of these clear and, and simple dichotomies that in practice and reality are often much, much more complex. And in, in reality, things are often, if not always, never this simple. And, and that's why when we create a map, for example, we don't put everything on it. We just seek to create something that we can use as a tool. The theory is something, something that works in a very similar way. Good, so what you're all seizing on here and what I was hoping for is that you would, you would argue that you should organize larger protests. And the reason that you should organize larger protests is because the working and middle classes have the upper hand. They hold the balance of relative class power. Those unions and workers associations and labor confederations are more densely organized and are stronger and have more resources and, and better infrastructure than do the capitalists and landowners who rival them. And this upper hand means that the workers and the middle classes have the capacity to facilitate a transition to democracy, even despite the effort or the desperation of the state, which clearly represents 
the elite and landowner and capitalist interests. And so the point that I want to make to you and that you all recognized and, and seized on yourselves is that you don't need to obey in this circumstance. The middle classes, the working classes are stronger than the elites. You are organizationally stronger than the capitalists and landowners. And the truth is, if you obey and go home, you are passing up an opportunity to use your relative class power to facilitate a transition to democracy. And that would be an unfortunate mistake because the dictatorship's economic policies already favor the old elites, meaning democratization will ultimately increase your wealth because it will mean a redistribution of income and economic policies that almost certainly would be more favorable to the masses. And so the point is, and the big picture, the takeaway is, you should protest until and unless the elites regain the upper hand. Now that's the key point. The balance of power is relatively fluid. It can change. It's a slow moving variable, but if we're talking about the space of many years, maybe it can shift, maybe it can change. But at this moment in time, you should not obey. You should absolutely resist and you should organize larger protests. Now you shouldn't always organize larger protests. If you're a mass or a member of the working or middle classes and the elites have the upper hand, well, in that case, you shouldn't organize larger protests. Maybe you should pursue some alternative strategy or you should try to strengthen the organization of the working and middle class so that you can obtain the upper hand and in shape or foster a, a transition to democracy at some earlier point. Matt says, this sounds like heaven on, on earth. <laughs> it does. Well, it's interesting to consider that, you know, there are examples of well-developed places now where the workers at some point were in a stronger position than the, the capitalists. And so Germany, for, for instance, although it was a late democratic developer in terms of its transition to democracy, much of the democratic advances, many of those advances in Germany were, were led by, by workers and, and by middle-class movements. But in other cases, there are clear workers of... lost their chance in Germany before that, though. Okay, go ahead, Matt. Elaborate. So this the German Social Democratic Party was like the largest workers' party in Europe uh, in the very beginning of the 20th century, uh, and this is like a real big time where these class relations were really at a peak. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when the, the Bolshevik revolution was. And uh, the German Social Democratic Party, I think had the largest membership and it was, you know, Germany at that time was the most industrious nation. So mm -hmm. uh, they, there were a lot of workers um, and they kind of sold out to the Kaiser. Yeah, so I think that in the, the end, the, 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 the capitalists got their way. Yeah, so what that suggests for us is that history is really an open book and that it's not as deterministic as these models suggest. And so while the workers well, were so well organized in Germany, clearly some of the, the forces of the old regime prevailed. And I think that there's obviously much more to the story, right? There's the fact that um, the oh, there, there always is the force of the force of the church and mm -hmm. and some of those old traditions in Germany were were quite powerful, but listen, everybody. Unfortunately, we're out of time for now. What I wanted you to see today is that under different circumstances, different strategies make sense uh, or make less sense, and what class you are and what interests you have and what the balance of power is all shape the decision that that is most optimal at a given point or a given time. In, in these scenarios, we saw that, that who you are and what the balance of power is make a big difference. So I'll see you on Monday when we will finish up some of this and then start a new unit 
eventually, but we're not quite done with democratization. We'll deal with a few more of these uh, examples and scenarios. Thanks so much for your engagement today. I think that we got a lot done and that we, we broke new ground. I'll see you again on Monday. Have a lovely weekend.